before I even start with the message today, I just got to say how I am blown away by the ministry this church does. You guys are awesome. So I am so thankful to now be a part of that, and I look forward to sharing that with you. But but thank you. I was just, as Nicole was going on and on, and this mission and that mission, and this and this and this, and I'm like, whoa, my head was spinning. I thought I should be taking notes or something. But that's what church is. Amen? Amen. 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 Take a moment and pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath. Fill my mouth with your message. For I ask all things in the beloved name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Labor Day weekend. Woohoo! It's considered by many of us to be the, at the end of summer unofficially. The final day of the year, which according to my mother, God rest her soul, final day of the year that you can wear white, ladies. Because my mother would think the fashion police will come and get you. She had this big thing which I just find funny. But then we have after Labor Day, right? Did the ice cream shops start to close up? The, uh... <laughs> that was funny. Um, and so you think Labor Day weekend, and you think, but pastor, Labor Day weekend's not a Christian holiday. Why are you wanting to celebrate Labor Day weekend in church? Well, when I thought about it, I thought, what is the church? We the people. What is Labor Day to celebrate? People. We the people. So why not make it a holiday that we can celebrate in church? So some information on Labor Day. In the United States, we recognize 10 public holidays for which many get a paid day off. We know most of them. Martin Luther King Day, President's Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, Columbus Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. But in other parts of the world, their days off vary. In India and Colombia, for example, they provide the greatest number of public holidays. They get 18. Yeah, we're really behind the ball here. But this was very interesting. In most countries around the world, they have labor laws that mandate a certain number of paid off days per year to their workers, in addition to the federal holidays. For example, those north in Canada get at least two weeks off by law. Two weeks paid from work. Workers in Brazil and France and Finland get 30 days off. And that does not include their national holidays. How many vacation days does the US government mandate for us? Zero, none. Unlike most nations around the world, the U.S. law does not require, does not require employers to grant any vacation or holiday time. And about 25% of all employees receive no paid vacation time or no paid holidays, except for the 10 federal holidays mentioned. While we love our paid holidays and vacation time, we don't normally measure the value of our life by how we spend that leisure time. We know that we're more likely to be evaluated by our professional work or our work life. When we meet people for the first time, is one of the questions you ever ask, what is it you do in your spare time? No, we ask, what do you do in your work life? The question isn't ever, hey, what are you doing? On Memorial Day, or Labor Day, or on a holiday. We love our vacation time, but then who doesn't? But when we experience extended periods of time, you could begin to feel that you're not contributing. You're not doing something meaningful. And some people do struggle with that. Maybe this is why some lottery winners will end up going back to work. Now, I know, first of all, they blew all their money. but. They go back to work because they need to feel useful. They need to feel that they contribute to society in some way. That explains why some people struggle with retirement. My husband will be retiring at the end of this year. I promise you, he won't have time to not feel useful. I've got a whole list to make him feel useful. Isn't that nice of me? We all want to know that we have a purpose that we are useful. 
We tend to define our lives by what we do, what we accomplish, what we achieve, but we need to feel useful. My mom, God rest her soul, uh, lived with my husband and I for many years, and when she first moved in, she was able to help out around the house, which just made her feel useful, but as she got older, she couldn't do anything. And I really saw firsthand that she felt she became, she felt she became a burden because she wasn't useful. So we had to find a job. So you know the Clorox wipes that come in the, the canister? It set one on the bathroom vanity. And every morning her job of the day was to take one out and wipe off the top of the vanity. And do you know when I would get home from work, she'd say to me, I did my job today. I didn't get to it till three o'clock, but I did it. And she was so proud of being useful. Tomorrow is Labor Day, an opportunity to think about what brings value to our lives. Are we in service, or is it more likely that we're out of service? Are we contributing or allowing life to just pass by? Are we engaged, or are we idling? Do we feel that we are full of use? In the short letter that we read today, and Wendy so nicely read for us, that's really, that's the whole book. That's the whole book of Philemon. And that, that's the, you, you got to hear it firsthand here today. So it's about Philemon, the slave owner, and his runaway slave, Onesimus. Philemon appears to have an ongoing relationship with Paul. The letter is addressed to him and the leaders of the church that meets in his house. And it's likely that Paul actually founded this congregation on one of his many journeys, or had at least visited with them and preached to them. Onesimus is Philemon's slave who ran away and somehow found his way to Paul. This letter does not go into detail about what happened between the slave and the slave owner. Rather than dwelling on the past, Paul is interested in the future. Onesimus, the slave, is a different person now. He's been changed by the grace of God. During his time with Paul, Onesimus has come to faith in Jesus Christ, and he becomes convinced that he has to return to Philemon. This letter by Paul was probably delivered by the runaway slave himself to the one who owns him and would be expected to treat him harshly. Returning to Philemon was considered the right thing to do. He needed to do that. Legally, that's where Onesimus belonged. Unfortunately, Paul never addresses the injustice of slavery in his letter to Philemon, but slavery is understood as a cultural norm in those days. Onesimus and most everyone at that time simply accepted slavery. Paul does, however, write about Onesimus in ways that one would not have talked about a slave in those days. He affectionately describes him, how he became Onesimus' father in the faith, and how Onesimus has captured his heart. Paul is so impressed with Onesimus that he tells Philemon how he considered asking him to stay. Paul, bound in prison, clearly has a soft spot in his heart for Onesimus, and perhaps all who were being held in the bonds of slavery. While Paul never overtly condemns slavery as sin, he appeals to Philemon's faithfulness to love the way Jesus Christ has taught him to love. He asks Philemon to forgive and receive Onesimus, not as a slave any longer, but as a brother, as though he were Paul himself. Paul even offers to pay whatever Onesimus owes. Paul seeks to convince, Ones <clears throat> to convince Philemon that his and Onesimus' social status of slave owner and slave no longer apply. All that really matters is that they are siblings in Christ Jesus. In verse 11, Paul offers Philemon a new way of seeing Onesimus as himself. Philemon must have been a man of some means. He is wealthy and has enough social status to have slaves. He also owns a house large enough for the church to meet at. Onesimus is identified solely as a slave. His value is seen only in what he does to serve 
Philemon and his household. Paul nails it when he tells Philemon that Onesimus has been useless to him while he was away, and possibly even before that. Then Paul refocuses Philemon's view by pointing out how Onesimus is now useful to both of them, not as a slave, but as a brother, a fellow disciple. Onesimus, former social status, is dissolved. So too is Philemon's. Paul appealed that all human beings are inherent of inherent worth. It may seem obvious to one today, but in that time, in Paul's time, in Philemon's time, in Onesimus' time, however, it would have been considered very radical. The notion that two people from very different social standings could be equals was just unheard of. Yet for Paul, this is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we read in Galatians 3.28 or Colossians 3.11, all those categories that subject one person to another are gone. There's no longer slave and free. Instead, we are all one in Christ. Many people today outside of work struggle with trying to find their own self-worth outside of work. The holiday that we celebrate this weekend grew out of laborers' desires to be valued beyond their jobs and to have lives beyond work. The history of Labor Day traces back to a demonstration by the Central Labor Union on Tuesday, September 5, 1882. This New York City trade union organized a parade, some may call it a march, from City Hall to Reservoir Park in Union Square. At the park, there were picnics, concerts, speeches, all calling and wanting an eight-hour workday. At the time, the average work week for a full-time manufacturing employee, how many hours do you think a week? A hundred. That was their average work week. That works out to be about 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Imagine working from 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. every day. That sure doesn't leave much time for anything else. <laughs> Congress passed legislation creating Labor Day in 1894. However, it would take 48 years for the speeches made in Reservoir Park to bear fruit. The eight-hour work day and the 40-hour work week did not become the standard we know today until 1940. Many businesses today still work their employees way more than 40 hours a week. I know my husband's job, he's in the building industries, and they work 10 hour days, five days a week. That's their minimum at 50 hours. So it hasn't been made universal yet. Many people struggle to find a balance between work and the rest of our lives. Even as we celebrate Labor Day, we might be tempted to peek at email, right? Check the office voicemail, just to make sure you haven't missed anything. We want to believe our lot, we want to believe that our lives are more than what we do. Yet we're unable to disengage from that work. We still tend to measure our lives, but what we do, our roles, our jobs our informal social statuses. Some of us view ourselves much in the same way Philemon had once viewed Onesimus, only useful at work. The key verse is verse 11. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to both you and me. Onesimus was once useless, but is now useful. Or we could say by inverting the two syllables of this word, full of use. Useful, full of use. In Christ, Onesimus became full of use. He found his true self, his use, useful, usefulness. He is no longer a slave whose sole purpose was to serve Philemon. Instead, Onesimus is now a disciple of Jesus Christ. Called like Philemon, called like Paul, to serve Christ, by serving others. We too are full of use. 
whether we're employed, unemployed, or underemployed, whether we have much or whether we have little, whether we feel satisfied or frustrated at work, whether our employer appreciates us or not, whether we feel empowered or powerless, we are full of use as disciples of Jesus Christ, called to serve him in our everyday living. We serve Christ when we dig wells that provide safe water, when we build hospitals to serve the ill and volunteer in soup kitchens and homeless shelters, or when there's volunteers to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We serve Christ when we go on mission trips, whether they're here or abroad. We show the love of Jesus when we arrange youth activities. We're driving a friend to a doctor's office. We serve Christ when we give a full day's wage, when we, <clears throat> when we do our job and, and we do it with integrity. We are full of use when we go to our jobs or go to school, when we parent our children, where we care for our parents when we drive the kids to soccer practice or when we give food to a neighbor, we are showing the love of Jesus Christ and we are being useful. Our lives are not measured by what we do in our jobs. Instead, they are measured by our usefulness to Christ, whether we feel like Onesimus, Philemon, or Paul. Labor Day is a time to give thanks to God for our jobs. Do we thank God for work? Around the world, many thousands of people would love to have a job. On Labor Day, we also thank God for all of those who work to normalize a 40-hour work week. On this Labor Day Sunday, we also recommit ourselves to finding our usefulness in Christ rather than in our jobs. We are more than our jobs. We are full of use for Christ and for his kingdom. Our good and gracious God told us from the very beginning that we would earn our bread by the sweat of our brow. We depend on each other in our laboring. We depend on the migrant workers who pick our lettuce and our strawberries, the nurses' aides who empty bedpans, the teachers who form our children's minds. God has blessed us with gifts and talents that allow us to earn a living and contribute something positive to our world. It is God who sustains all of us in his love. We must realize that we have worth as human beings, job or no job. Especially when our society preaches to us that our worth comes from success and money. But our worth comes because God created us. We are his children, no matter what our job status is. We must love and support each other. We must keep prayer, keep in prayer for those who do the, the dirty work of our lives, for those who break their backs for us, for those who cheated out of even a minimum wage, those who do not have health care, those who cannot afford to send their kids to college. We need to keep them all in our prayers. We are one in the Lord. We are community as a nation because we depend on each other. Even that simple, I broke show and tell. So I have a can of corn, right? So shop right, can get sale, probably cost me what, 50 cents. Okay, for the can of corn. This simple can of corn from the grocery store has had thousands of people standing behind it. From the grocery store shelf, the thousands of people, those who stock the shelves, the truckers who transport this can to the grocery store. From the regional warehouse workers to the rail workers who supply the warehouse to the farmers, the harvesters, the granary workers. Then there are others such as those who supply the fertilizer that aid in the growth and the development of agricultural technologies over the years. People also labored to build the roads and the rails over which this product has traveled to get to my local store. Others supply fuel for the trucks, combines, and locomotives. Coal miners work hard to supply the electricity needed all along the way, and still others in banking and business who 
perhaps gave a loan to a store that could open so that I could go buy a can of corn. The list of people who have worked so that you and I can spend 50 cents on a can of vegetables. So many workers. We are all one in the Lord. We all need each other. We need the thousand people who were behind this can of corn or we wouldn't have it on the grocery shelves to go and buy. May we realize this weekend how dependent we are on each other. We are one. We are family. We need each other. Let us give thanks for each other this Labor Day weekend. Let us celebrate and give thanks for each other and appreciate the value, the dignity, the contribution that each and every person makes in this great country of ours. And in these tough times, remembering the words of Jesus, come to me, all who, are la who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Amen? Amen. Amen. We'll continue now with a service of Holy Communion. <laughs> 